Now may, may I invite you to join in prayer as we commit ourselves, our hearts and minds uh, to, uh, to the Lord as we listen to his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this precious word that you have inspired through the Holy Spirit, that you have entrusted to the church, and that you have preserved over these 2,000 years. We thank you for those who have labored to translate it into languages around the world. We thank you, Lord, that you have given to us the Holy Spirit and the body of Christ through which we may be able to interpret this precious message from you. The word that tells us about Jesus Christ, your Son, and how through him we may have a new life and a new hope and a new beginning. We thank you for your presence now among us through the Holy Spirit. And as we think especially about the gifts that he has brought to the church, we humble ourselves and submit ourselves to the, to the Lord, the Spirit of God, that he may speak with us, that he may urge us, that he may convict us, that he may renew our hearts and fill us again tonight. For we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, if you have your Bible with you. Prophecy, tongues, and order in worship. One of the most defining phenomena of today's world is social media. None of us can do without it, and especially in the COVID year, we became even more attached to these various platforms like Facebook and Twitter, Instagram and Snapchat, that have enabled individuals to communicate verbally and visually with an unlimited universal audience. In many instances, these modern means of communication have been used for enormous amounts of good and benefit, whether it is for crowdfunding a desperate need or alerting people about a potential threat or informing the world about the effects of climate change or simply sharing the joys of our personal experiences. But social media has also been a means by which people have bullied others or spread racist ideas or inspired masses to violence. Of course, the most recent incident when masses were rallied to violence and unlawful cause, uh, using this means of communication offered by social media was the storming of the US Capitol on the 6th of January in 2021. And President Donald Trump had used his Twitter account to incite his 88 million followers to revolt against the election of Joe Biden. On the 6th of January, uh, we know that he met briefly with the mob that gathered in Washington, D.C., and he said these words, we are going to walk down Pennsylvania Avenue, and we are going to the Capitol, and we are going to try and give our Republicans, the weak ones, the kind of pride and boldness that they need to take back the country. And a couple of hours later, the unthinkable happened. He has now been blocked by Twitter and by F Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat, and why? Because sooner or later, it becomes clear to everyone that unless the freedom of speech is governed by ethical conduct, what will result is not the upbuilding of human community, but an assault on the very symbols of ordered society. As we come to this 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians, we find that Paul is reasserting this very principle for the church in Corinth. The Christians there had been blessed, as we remembered again and again, with the full range of the spiritual gifts. In chapter 1 and verse 7, Paul says, you do not lack any spiritual gift. And from this, they had become particularly attached to the gift of speaking in tongues, or what we call glossolalia, and which they delighted to use without restraint whenever the church gathered. No one understood, of course, what they were saying, uh, because tongues, by its very nature, the, uh, is the utterance of mysteries of the Spirit, says Paul. But they all competed to be heard in the assembly at the same time, as they all spoke in tongues as loud as they could. It was as if the, the, the Corinthian church 
had become like the Tower of Babel. And so it presumably became a cacophony of deafening noise and utter bedlam that alienated the members of the church one from another and horrified their non-Christian visitors. Now the world understands today more than ever that the freedom of speech must be governed by ethical conduct if not, what will result is not the upbuilding of human community, but an assault on the very symbols of ordered society. In this similar way, Paul is convinced that all those spiritual gifts of verbal communication are intended for the edification of the church. They could as easily be misused for the glorification of the self. And when this happens, what will result is not the building up of the Christian community, but an assault of the very fabric of Christian order. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is the final part of a discussion that began in chapter 12 and verse 1. You remember how Paul begins this section with that fam famous word, now then. And in verse 1 of chapter 12, he says these words, now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters. And from this point on, Paul will go on to talk about this particular subject. Now in the 1960s, there was a delightful series of books that were published in the United States to help children understand science and history better, school children, uh, children and young teenagers. And these books were called, if you remember, all those who are my age and a little around that time, you remember those books were called How and Why Books. And I'm sure many of us in this congregation have seen some of those and used and maybe even have a collectible with you. These How and Why Wonder Books, they were called. Uh, there were four, uh, 74 uh, books in all that were produced and they uh, talked about machines and stars and the weather and dinosaurs and mammals and so on. And that was a way of introducing to young children history and science and to take these rather complex subjects and make them understandable so that a child could be able to grasp the essentials of one of those 74 subjects. I want to suggest that 1 Corinthians chapter 12 to 14 is Paul's how and why wonder book on spiritual gifts. It's a, it's a rich resource for us. And because of the troubles of the church in Corinth, we are blessed today to have these three chapters that talk about how and why of spiritual gifts. And you remember how in chapter 12, Paul had first established what the spiritual gifts were. Uh, the list was read out to us, and you find it in chapter 12, like wonders and, sign, uh, and miracles and healings and administration and tongues and interpretation and prophecy. But he also explained why spiritual gifts were given by the Holy Spirit. Remember in chapter 12 and verse 7 it says, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So why are spiritual gifts given? We go back to those basics and we say we have a spiritual gift so that the body of Jesus Christ may be edified. Spiritual gifts are intended for the common good and not for personal glory. But then in chapter 13, Paul had gone on to the how of spiritual gifts. How are spiritual gifts to be effectively used? And the whole of that chapter is his emphasis on the how. He says in verse 1, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clashing cymbal. In other words, if I use my gifts and I don't do it through the means of love, then I have just become a noise. In fact, a rather unpleasant sound. And so the why for the common good and the how through a, through a commitment to love is what Paul talks about in chapter 12 and 13. The what, the why, and the how. And he reiterates this in chapter 14, verse 1, when he says, follow the way of love, chapter 13, and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, chapter 12, especially prophecy. So with chapter 14, Paul comes to the very specific and most pressing issue that troubled the Corinthian believers. And what was that? 
Their question was the place and the use of spiritual gifts of verbal communication in corporate worship. So there is a shift from chapter 12 and 13 as Paul focuses in on the issue that is bothering them. What is bothering them is not the issue of miracles or leadership. What is bothering them is the gifts of verbal communication, especially the gift of tongues. So they're asking questions like, how are we to understand the supernatural abilities we have that involve verbal communication, like words of knowledge, prophecy, revelations, teachings, and tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. And then, in addition to that, of these, since tongues is the most spectacular, isn't it the most important? Since tongues is the most spectacular, surely it must be the most important. And so we know when we read chapter 14 carefully, that the burden of this chapter is entirely on the subject of the spiritual gifts of verbal communication. Because as I said here, Paul does not mention miracles, he does not mention healings, administration, faith, or leadership. His entire focus is on speech. And most specifically, he focuses in chapter 14 on comparing tongues with prophecy. So when you look at the chapter, chapter 14, and you think about the statistics, in chapter 14, Paul uses the word prophecy or prophesy eight times out of the total of 11 times in the book. He uses the word tongues 15 times out of the 21 times it will come in the whole book. And then, of course, he uses the word speaking or talking, a staggering 25 times out of the 34 times that that particular verb occurs in the book of 1 Corinthians. So tongues, prophecy, speaking, this is what the chapter is about. Paul is trying to talk to the church about how to talk in church. How should we conduct our speech, whether it is natural speaking or supernatural enabling to speak, but how do we use our tongue, whether it is through the gifts of tongues and the language of angels, or it is the usual instruction and conversations that we have. And then he uses another very special word, building up. Edifying is found 11, uh, seven times out of the 11 times it's found in the whole book. So we get the idea just by looking at the statistics. Today, you know, we are always looking at statistics, coronavirus statistics. Speaking, prophecy, tongues, and then mixed into that, the word building up, edifying. All of this has to be about edifying the body of Christ. So Paul, when he writes his letters, 13 of them in the New Testament, he talks a lot about our tongue. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29, this is what he says. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now this is easy said, but very difficult done. But Paul is saying that the person who is led of the Spirit in fact, he speaks about the Holy Spirit in the very next verse. He's saying the person who is filled with the Holy Spirit is someone who takes care not to let any unwholesome talk come out of his mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up. You see that word again, building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So you can see again here that speech can be used for good, or for bad, for unwholesome, or for edifying. But notice the rule, only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So as we read this chapter, Paul is talking to a church that has a lot of tongue speaking, but also has the gift of prophecy and other verbal communication gifts. And he's trying to say to them, if you must choose then give priority to the gifts according to their potential for building others up. And that's how he begins with verse 1. Eagerly uh, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. Now in the early church, they experienced two spectacular...
spectacular charismatic phenomena. One was speaking in tongues, it was unprecedented. So many people suddenly speaking in a language or languages that no one had learned before. And the other was the gift of prophesying, being able to speak a word from God. So I want to give you a little more, uh, spend a little moment on that. Now, what is this tongues? We also call it glossolalia. And this referred to the ability given to a person to produce a unique speech that they had never heard or learned before. It wasn't just individual sounds, but it was a language that flowed freely, now which they could also speak at will. In fact, with practice, they became quite good at this, so that they could even sing in tongues, as we read later on in the chapter. But it wasn't a known human language. Of course, in the book of Acts, we know that known human languages were also given as a gift when the Holy Spirit came. But here we are told that it is not a known human language. It was a speech inspired by the Holy Spirit as a language of praise and prayer to be directed to God. So you will see that in verse 2 he says, For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. So what did these tongues accomplish? We are told in the chapter that the tongues accomplished two things. One is tongues glorified God because it was praise and prayer directed to him. But there is another thing that tongues accomplished in the believer. And we found that in verse 4. It says, anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. So in a wonderful way, the Holy Spirit gives a person this gift. And as the person uses this gift to praise God, there is also a great nourishment of the person's inner being, edifying of himself. The second great charismatic gift was the gift of prophesying. Now this phenomena of prophesying in the early church was not like the prophetic ministry exercised by the Old Testament prophets. We know people like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and so on. They were prophets that God set apart for a particular role in Israel. They were, they were people who were given the office of prophet. And they were told to go to the people of Israel and say, Thus says the Lord. And to remind the Israelites of the covenant that God had made with them through Moses. The covenant that they were violating. And so the prophets were kind of encouragers. And uh, they were prosecutors of the covenant. Reminding the people of their covenant responsibilities. But in the New Testament, we find that there is a thing called the gift of prophecy. And when we read this chapter, it was something that was given to many people. In fact, Paul is saying that everyone may prophesy. And what he is talking about is about a spontaneous word given to God's people for the edification of the whole. A word, an instruction, a, a comment that will build up, that is given by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit ministers through this person a word that is from the Lord. And so in verse 3 you see that. The one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging and comfort. And so you find these two gifts, tongues and prophecy. Now is Paul against tongues? Because he says, I would rather that you prophesy. Is it that he is against tongues? Or is he saying like some do today, that tongues are of no value? There are people today who would say there is no need for tongues. Not at all. In fact, in chapter 14 and verse 5, he says, I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. If Paul was here, he would say that to us and we would get rather uncomfortable. Because, wow, how am I going to speak in tongues? But that's a gift of the Spirit. So he's asking the body of Christ to expect and to desire to speak in tongues. And in chapter 14 and verse 18, he says, uh, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. During the time that I served as a youth worker here in KMC, there were several instances where young people, young leaders and so on, received the gift of tongues. Now, I didn't get that blessing. But I remember those instances when people received the gift of tongues. And even though I didn't get that blessing, 
I knew that this is what the scripture says that some of you will speak in tongues because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit now when these rare moments happened we were thrilled that the Holy Spirit had distributed that enablement to our brothers and sisters of course it was never used carelessly or in a Corinthian way but perhaps with the little appreciation of such spiritual gifts in our context people have found it difficult to maintain their enthusiasm for that gift of the spirit that was given to them perhaps therefore they neglected the gift and fell into disuse so I want to encourage all those who have received that gift of tongues to uh, to use it regularly in your prayers and to increase in the gift and don't neglect it you have received that gift of tongues I would encourage you to continue to use it as your prayer language Paul is very positive about it in chapter 14 verse 13 to 17 although he's dealing with the abuse of the gift of tongues Paul acknowledges that speaking in tongues it means that my spirit is praying it means that my spirit is singing it means that I am praising God in the spirit and I'm giving thanks well enough to God you notice that in that passage praying with my spirit singing with my spirit praising God in the spirit and giving thanks well enough but Paul is not decrying tongue speaking but he is challenging the unchristian and infantile abuse of tongues for personal glory you see when people were using these gifts in the church simply so that they would get attention to themselves Paul is saying that's not the purpose no gift should be used with that kind of attitude now this is not very strange to us today is it it is commonplace for us to find preachers and pastors who use tongues in corporate worship as if it is an essential for them to cha to charge their spiritual batteries so they would go about in the service using these gifts publicly as if by doing so they can charge up their spiritual batteries but the Bible doesn't talk about tongues being used in that way it is of course very impressive when you hear a pastor or a preacher constantly using tongues as he goes about the public worship without any interpretation Paul says whenever tongues is used like that in, 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 in public to be spoken to others you have to have interpretation it is very impressive it creates a sense of mystique to the performance but nowhere in the New Testament do we find such an expectation in fact Paul is saying categorically that public use of tongues is forbidden forbidden unless it is accompanied by interpretation in verse 6 now brothers and sisters if I come to you and speak in tongues what good will I, will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction so what is he saying tongues is to be used only if it is understandable through interpretation because the most important thing is to bring benefit to the body of Christ so Paul says tongues is great I would love for every Christian to have this blessing of this amazing gift I speak in tongues more than all of you but then he's trying to say but I am not about me I am all about the church the body of Christ for this reason my focus is not on the gifts or even who has the gifts no my singular focus is on why has God given these gifts <clears throat> the Bible says it's for the common good it says that the Holy Spirit has distributed gifts to build up the body of Christ to edify the community now if that is the purpose then what would I choose he's saying will I choose tongues in public worship or will I choose prophecy for Paul of course that was a no-brainer as we would call it how would you choose between tongues and prophecy in public worship he says there is no need to discuss it because tongues is something that you are directing to God in a language that no one else understands but prophecy is directed to one another in a language that everyone understands you know dear friends that the reason God has placed each one of us as a member of the church of the local church 
is because Jesus Christ is doing something amazing in the world. He is recreating human society in the way that he had originally intended it. This new society is what the Bible calls the church. Not just the Kolupitiya Methodist Church, but the body of Christ around the world is the new society that God is now recreating for himself. It's a, it's a people that has been called out from the world to be exclusively God's possession. We are to be shaped in the image of Jesus Christ. We are to become that sacred society with whom God will make his home for eternity. And you know what? He's inviting every one of us to join him in this grand project of preparing a people for himself. It's like the construction of the Old Testament tabernacle, if you remember in the book of Exodus. He invites each one of us to contribute our offerings and to contribute our skills so that we may build this new society for him. So you have a job in the church. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter whether you have been recognized for it, but you and I have a job in the church. It's my responsibility and your responsibility to build and to encourage someone, to teach someone, to help someone move from an, a place of error, to stand with someone. There is no such thing as a solitary Christian. We are here for each other. And the most powerful and effective way to stimulate this building up of one another, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, is the use of prophecy or the words of inspiration that the Lord puts in our heart so that we may build one another up. Now what is very interesting is that this is what the New Testament scriptures is all about. The Corinthians did not have a New Testament. Their Bible went from Genesis to Malachi. Their Bible was the Old Testament. They, of course, had the teachings of the apostles. They remembered some of the things that Paul and Peter taught them. But they didn't have the New Testament. But the Holy Spirit, in his gracious providence to us, has gathered all those inspired words, and he has put it together in 27 books and given it to us. We have the New Testament. And so the New Testament helps us to build one another up along with spontaneous gifts of prophecy. We can use this amazing gift God has given us to build each other up. And that's what we do. That's what we are doing right now. Using 1 Corinthians chapter 14 to build one another up. Because the whole focus is to use our speaking gifts in order to edify and build each other. So we are blessed because we have the complete Christian scriptures. But I ask again, as I have asked several times, how are we committing ourselves to this ministry of building one another up through the inspired word of God? Are we involved in that regular disciplined reading of the spirit-inspired word? Did you get a chance to read your word today, the scripture today? Is there a soaking of the scripture in our hearts? Are we involved in the regular discipline reading? Are we committed to reading and interpreting the scriptures as a body? Do we venture to share what we have learned with someone in our family? Or maybe a friend, maybe another brother or sister in the church? Can we share, like Paul says, five intelligible words with another person today? He says, I would rather share five intelligible words than 10,000 words in a tongue. Can't we share five words of encouragement? We certainly may. And so in chapter 14 and verse 20 to 25, Paul is saying with the Corinthians, the problem is the problem of immaturity. They are behaving like children. There is a sense in which they've got stuck in this infancy. In chapter 3 and verse 1, he had said to them these words, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. Children speak boasting about themselves. But in the church, we are a different community. Paul wants us to grow up. He says in, in chapter 14 and verse 20, brothers and sisters, stop thinking like little children. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. So we want to grow up. We want to be a church that is mature in the way we carry and use the spiritual gifts. 
What is Paul saying? He's saying, think about building one another up. Use the gifts God has given you in the way that he has designed it. And so in verse 26 to 33, Paul is saying, corporate worship must be intentional and orderly if it is to be the adoration of God and the encouragement of the church. And we are blessed that here we have learned to find ways to have orderly worship. And we need to be grateful for those who lead us in the full act of worship so that we are able to be intentional about what we do in adoring God and encouraging one another. So he says everything must be done so that the church may be built up, verse 26. And then he says that everything must be done in some order. Of course, people may come with various things like a hymn or a, or a revelation. You know, in those days, they didn't have this kind of very strict order. People would come to church and someone would say, I want to share a hymn. And another person would say, I have a revelation. Another would say, I would have a tongue. Paul says, simply do it in order so that you show courtesy to one another. And you are able to bless one another. This is why what was called the Toronto Blessing in the 1990s became such an exercise in excessiveness that eventually brought about a lot of confusion and disillusionment around the world because it was uh, gifts that were used with no concern for restraint and order. Paul says, finally, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. And so we learn from this chapter what Paul is emphasizing to them that we are to use our gifts in a way that will build one another up and so honor the God of order and the God of peace. Let us take a moment to reflect on this as we prepare to sing our final hymn. Perhaps some of us remember the gift that the Lord has given to us which we have neglected. And we are now committing ourselves to use those gifts in the way that they are intended for use. Those who have gifts of tongues to use it in prayer and praise. Those who have the inspiration of prophecy to be ready to use it for the building up of one another. And all of us given the great blessing of the New Testament and the whole of Scripture, to use it regularly to edify ourselves and to bless and edify each other. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Spirit who has given many gifts to the Church. We ask that we will please you by using them in a way that is orderly and courteous and helps to build one another up. In Jesus' name we pray.